Hi, my name is Mas Takashima, and I'm the Program Director of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery here at Baylor College of Medicine. And I'm also the uh, Director of the Sinus Center at Baylor College of Medicine, and I get the opportunity to talk today about one of my favorite topics, of course, of sinusitis. And so let's go ahead and get started here. So let's take a look at our learning objectives. Uh, so a, a couple of things. One, we're, we're going to talk about what exactly the sinuses are. Uh, number two, we're going to talk a little bit about the sinus anatomy because if you're talking about sinusitis, you really need to know a little bit about the anatomy um, that that you'll be talking that we'll be talking about here. In addition to that, I want all of you guys to be able to recognize and treat typical cases of sinusitis, and of course, we all need to know about the potential complications that can occur with uh, untreated or poorly treated sinusitis. And so I'm sure we've all seen a patient such as this, which we quote call the quote trouble patient, where the patient comes in and, and the patient has a whole slew of different uh, uh, complaints, mainly doctor, I have a headache, I have dizziness, uh, I have a sinus, I have a constant lump in my throat, skin rashes, chronic fatigue. And if you really think about all these symptoms that the patient is complaining of, one, of course, it could be allergies, but two, it can really be sinusitis as well. And so... You know, for some of these uh, complex patients where a lot of things are going on, you really have to keep allergies and sinusitis as a potential uh, a, a point in your differential. And so let's move ahead and talk a little bit about what the sinuses are and what exactly, uh, what do the sinuses actually do. And so if you look at the slide here, you can see that uh, the sinuses imparts resonance to the voice and so if you have big chambers uh, inside uh, as part of your skull then that actually will resonate as you talk and so it can impart resonance. It is also thought to humidify and warm inspired air and so as you can imagine the sinuses are, are, are big spaces inside your nose uh, and your skull and so it increases the uh, surface area where the air can be humidified and warm. In addition to this, it is thought that the sinuses absorb the shock. So if there's any trauma to the head, it sort of protects the brain by serving as almost like shock absorbers or crumple zones. Uh, the sinuses are also thought to uh, keep the nasal chambers moist, thermal insulation for the brain. It also contributes to facial growth. It can also represent the vestigial structures and of course, it is also known to lighten bones of the skull. And so if we didn't have our sinuses, the, the, uh, the weight of our head would be significantly more. And this is clearly seen uh, in elephants as well. And so the sinuses, as we all know, are, are lined with respiratory mucosa. And the respiratory mucosa is comprised of ciliated pseudostratified columnar cells interspersed with goblet mucus cells. The uh, ciliated channels uh, promote uh, the flow of mucus, and so the openings of the sinuses are very particular in that all the cilia are sort of geared towards moving the mucus towards the opening of the sinuses. And that's the reason why even for the maxillary sinuses, we never really punch holes along the floor of the maxillary sinus. Uh, before we really knew about the, uh, the function of the cilia, we we're always thinking about punching small holes along the floor of the sinus, thinking that the dependent drainage will actually help with that. But what we've realized is that the cilia, even if there is a hole lower down, it does not promote flow of mucus to that lower dependent opening. But instead, it will actually uh, uh, channel the mucus directly to the openings, natural openings of the sinuses. And that's the reason why now our philosophy is to dilate the, op the natural opening of the sinuses rather than creating access accessory sinus uh, openings. And so as you can see in this slide, uh, especially in, in this, uh, this graph here, this sort of shows the flow of mucus from the sinuses. And the majority of the flow of the mucus actually does go posteriorly, although some of the sinuses along the anterior ethmoids, the maxillary sinuses, can also actually come out anteriorly as well. But the sinuses mainly are divided into two groups, the anterior and the posterior groups. And the anterior groups are thought to be the frontal sinuses, the maxillary sinuses, and the anterior ethmoid sinuses. And the posterior group is thought to be the posterior ethmoids, uh, along with the sphenoid sinuses. And because of the way the sinuses drain, especially the posterior component of the sinuses, which tends to 
to uh, flow posteriorly, you may not actually have anterior rhinorrhea or runny nose, uh, but more of post-nasal drip uh, complaints. And so let's briefly talk a little bit about the maxillary sinuses, or the largest sinuses that we have, which is located behind the cheeks. They are typically present at birth, but they slowly aerate over time, and they're full size uh, during the teenage years. It occupies the maxilla, and it's about 15 cc's in volume in adults. A couple of clinical aspects to think about um, with, in regards to the maxillary sinus is that um, sometimes you can actually get maxillary sinus uh, disease or recurrent infections of the maxillary sinus if there is a bad tooth, and especially the molars. The upper molars, actually the roots of the upper molars, uh, embed uh, towards the sinuses and sometimes they actually extend into the sinuses themselves. And so if you have a periapical abscess of one of the molar roots, you can get chronic sinus infections on that side. But in addition to that, if you also get some dental work done and you get a tooth pulled or you actually have some dental implants placed or even a root canal, you need to make sure that that is not penetrating through the mucosa into the, the, the maxillary sinus. Because if that is the case and the patient is having recurring sinus disease, uh, in that sinus, then clearly uh, further dental work would need to be done, possibly even removing some of the implants and or closing an oral uh, sinus fistula. In addition to that, we also see some uh, variations uh, of the maxillary sinuses, such as septations of the sinuses or, or duplication of the maxillary sinus. But in addition to that, you can also uh, get the hypoplasia of the maxillary sinus, and that's shown in the second picture here. Uh, and as you can see, the right side, the patient has a very small maxillary sinus on this side, while a large maxillary sinus on the other, and it could be congenital. It could be something called silent sinus syndrome, where the openings of the maxillary sinus is blocked since childhood, and as, as the uh, maxillary sinus tries to continue to aerate, it is unable to pull air, and thus it stays small. But in addition to that, if you have bilateral hypoplasias, that's typically seen more commonly in uh, cystic fibrosis patients. Now, the, uh, the importance of this is that as the sinus, uh, if it stays small, then uh, typically if you're trying to irrigate the sinuses or operate on the sinuses, you really need to realize that the orbit actually uh, drops down a little bit lower than it should with, a, if, with an aerated sinus. So as you can see, an aerated maxillary sinus on the other side, and it sort of props up the orbit while on this side here it does not. And so uh, as you can imagine, if you're trying to uh, open up the sinus, there's a higher degree of uh, potential injury to the orbit uh, because the orbit is in a much lower position. Yeah, let's uh, move on to the sphenoid sinus. The sphenoid sinus is located in the center of the head. It's typically absent in uh, approximately 1% of the population. The volume is approximately about 7 uh, to 7.4 centimeters cubed. Uh, there is a high variation, and what I mean by variation is that you can get, you can have a very prominent cella protruding into the sphenoid sinus, or you can have uh, the, the septum, which is not in the midline position, or you can have uh, accessory septations in the sphenoid sinus as well. And so it's really important to study the scans to see exactly what you're dealing with, especially if you're thinking about operating uh, into the sphenoid sinus. So here are some uh, depictions of uh, where the sphenoid sinus uh, lies. And as you can see on the first picture here, that's just a, uh, a, a sagittal cut. And uh, through the sagittal cut, you can actually see the entire clivus, which is located here. And the, uh, the sphenoid sinus is located in this area here, aerating into the clivus. This is actually the cella. And the cella is where the pituitary gland lies. This area is called the tuberculum cella. And this right here is called the planum sphenoidal. And this is actually a coronal cut, so you can see the temporal lobes here, temporal lobes here. You can see the pituitary gla uh, gland located right here. You can see the optic nerves here, pituitary stalk coming down, cavernous sinus, cavernous sinus. You see the sphenoid sinus, sphenoid sinus. And lastly, let's talk a little bit about the ethmoid sinuses. The ethmoid sinuses are the most complex of the sinuses in that there are multiple air cells uh, with its own ostium. Uh, there's approximately 4 to 17 air cells per side. And the location of it sort of makes it a little tricky in that, uh, as you can see here, the orbit is uh, the orbital wall is right here. 
the skull base is up here. And so it's in a very narrow space between the skull base and the orbital wall. And the ethmoid sinuses are located uh, right in between. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the frontal sinuses. The frontal sinuses are located right here, right above the orbit. So you can see the orbit here, orbit here. These are where the frontal sinuses lie. And this is actually a sagittal cut. And uh, you can sort of see the frontal sinus here. So the brain will be located behind the frontal sinus. And this is the anterior table of the frontal sinus, posterior table of the frontal sinus, floor of the frontal sinus. And this is actually inside the nose right here. And so the uniqueness of the frontal sinus is that it is located in our forehead. So evaluating the frontal sinus can be difficult. You really need angled scopes, angled instruments to really try to access the area of the frontal sinus. And so I always go through this uh, little uh, graph here. And this, what we're looking at is a, uh, a coronal cut of a cadaver painstakingly cut uh, in, in small slices and uh, we'll go through the anatomy here uh, as the cuts continue to progress and so right here what we're looking at is we're looking at the cartilages of the nose you can sort of see the septum nasal septum you can start seeing the eyes coming right here and here you can see some slight uh, shadowing of the eyebrows and of course the mouth is down here so as we keep on uh, visualizing the different cuts, you can see the or orbits there. Let's go through that again. All right, so one of the first sinuses that we see here are the frontal sinuses located above the orbits here. These are the ethmoid sinuses between the eyes. This is the middle turbinate. This is the inferior turbinate, lower down. You see the uh, infraorbital nerve right here. This is the maxillary sinus. Maxillary sinus on the left right here. The nasal septum is right here. And uh, as we can keep uh, traversing posteriorly, we see the, the sphenoid sinus as it appeared at, at the last uh, part of the, uh, the video. All right, so now that we've uh, gone through the anatomy, let's talk a little bit about allergies versus sinusitis. And this is actually a very difficult concept to, to really understand and identify, diagnose, and treat. Uh, and the reason for that is because allergies and sinus disease can actually present with very similar symptoms. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate a bad allergy attack versus having a sinus infection and vice versa. And so some clues that we use to try to differentiate the two is that with allergies, mainly sneezing, stuffy, runny nose is, is, is prevalent, clear or whitish nasal drip, itchy watery eyes and a burning sensation in the eyes or nose. Those are the common symptoms that we see with allergies. And from a sinusitis standpoint, we see fever, pain in the upper teeth, pressure or pain in the upper cheeks, top of the nose, or between the eyes or along the forehead. We also see a stuffy nose, thick yellow, greenish or grayish mucus drainage. And symptoms typically last greater than uh, 10 to 14 days. Now, in addition to that, what we really need to do is to ensure that we're not uh, seeing other possible pathologies. And one of the other things that you need to keep in the back of your mind, if a patient complains of unilateral uh, nasal drainage is a CSF leak or a CSF rhinorrhea. And this next video shows this. Uh, this was a patient that presented into my clinic with a unilateral rhinorrhea. And when we looked up uh, this patient's nose uh, with endoscopes, this is what we saw. And so as you can see, you can see the pulsations of the CSF into the nose.
can actually see that what we're looking at here is the roof of the ethmoid sinus with the skull base. And clearly this was the cause of the patient's uh, runny nose. So what are, what are some things that we utilize to diagnose if something is either a sinus infection or allergies? And sometimes, like I said, it can be very difficult. And so in those situations where we are having a hard time differentiating the two, we may decide to get some films. Now, we hardly ever get any plain films at this time. Uh, before CT scans, we used to get these Caldwell waters and, and uh, lateral views of the skull. But as you can see in these pictures, it's very difficult to ascertain what's a shadow, what's a normal shadow versus an abnormal shadow. And frequently, we're sort of guessing to see if there is pathology in the, in the sinuses versus having a, a CAT scan. And so the, the picture on the left shows a CT scan in a coronal plane. You can see the orbits. You can also see the maxillary sinuses. Black is air, white is bone, gray is soft tissue or inflammation. And so the patient does have a little bit of inflammation on the left side, but the majority of the disease process is located on the right side with a lot of thickening inside this patient's maxillary sinus. And uh, nowadays, we're also starting to do more 3D imaging as well, especially for patient uh, understanding and patient-informed uh, consent. We've realized that uh, 2D can be very difficult for patients to ascertain exactly what they're looking at. And so the 3D pictures tend to show in much greater detail while keeping the spatial orientation for patients to understand where the eyes are, where the brain uh, lies, where the ears are as well as the sinus disease. And here's further representation of uh, uh, 3D CTs that uh, we also utilize. Now, what else can we do? Well, we can also do rigid nasal endoscopies. And so these two videos show rigid nasal endoscopies done in our clinic. And, uh, you know, uh, if we're having a hard time differentiating, hey, does this patient have sinus infection, sinus disease? You can take a quick look inside the nose, suction the nose, ensure that you know there isn't any purulence. As you can see in both of these pictures, there is significant purulence in this patient's uh, sinuses, which we are uh, attempting to culture and uh, clean out. All right, so let's move on to discuss the concept of rhinosinusitis, or also known as sinusitis. The definition is that it is a condition manifested by an inflammatory disorder uh, involving typically the mucous membranes of the, navel ca na of the nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, and also you can also have thickening of the bone or osteitis of the bone, which can then cause recurring sinus disease as well. It is actually a, a, a prevalent disorder in that it is estimated that about 12.5% of the population have this disorder, and it's second only to arthritis in uh, frequency among chronic conditions affecting uh, Americans. Now, if we try to define the, 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 uh, the topic of rhinosinusitis to a greater detail, we actually can see that uh, it's defined as acute, subacute, chronic, or recurrent in nature. Acute rhinosinusitis is typically considered to be symptoms lasting for more than 10 days but less than four weeks. Subacute is thought to be symptoms lasting four to eight weeks. Chronic sinusitis is symptoms lasting longer than eight weeks. And recurring, recurrent sinusitis is uh, three or more acute episodes a year. Allergies is also thought to contribute to rhinosinusitis in that allergies can cause a lot of swelling inside the nose and with swelling inside the nose the openings of the sinuses can get blocked and when you get blockage of the opening of the sinuses then you get stasis of, of mucus and, uh, they, uh, and the mucus can then get infected. And so surgical success is also um, hinged upon improving allergy symptoms and thus, we really try to address the uh, allergies at the same time as we're addressing uh, chronic uh, rhinosinusitis. One, one of the difficulties that we encounter is determining if a patient has bacterial versus viral sinusitis. 
and uh, and and there's some tips and tricks that we use to try to differentiate the two. It's not a hundred percent, but it definitely gives us a guideline to go by when we're trying to differentiate the two. And so signs of symptoms uh, which are more favorable for bacterial rather than a viral sinusitis is that after about five to seven days, if, if um, the symptoms are, are continuing to get worse, and if it persists for greater than 10 days, and or if the symptoms are out of proportion to uh, a viral uh, URI, such as a severe pain, uh, facial pain, headaches, a unilateral uh, disease, those are all thought to be more bacterial in nature. You can also have unilateral uh, purulent uh, rhinorrhea. The pain can be worsened by bending over or uh, performing a balsava maneuver. Uh, patients also typically complain of a lot of teeth pain as well. They can respond poorly to decongestants. And uh, they can also have other sequelae of a bacterial infection, such as facial swelling, conjunctival infection, meningeal or other signs, uh, uh, which are typically signs of spread outside of the sinuses themselves. So let's talk a little bit about why some people get a viral infection and then all of a sudden get a sinus infection. The way that sort of works is that the viral infection or the upper respiratory infection uh, can then uh, cause mucosal inflammation. Now if you have a viral infection but on top of that you also have other um, causes of inflammation in the nose, such as allergies, uh, anatomical issues, or uh, even GERD, then that can actually worsen the mucosal inflammation, which then, like we had talked about, can cause the mucus stasis, which then, without the mucus being moved out appropriately, you get obstruction of the opening of the sinuses, which then leads to bacterial colonization and infection. Uh, you can also have uh, a um, weakened host defense system, which can then lead straight from a viral infection straight to a bacterial colonization and infection as well. And so the reason why it's important to identify a patient with viral versus bacterial uh, sinusitis is because viral upper respiratory infections and viral sinusitis will resolve without antibiotics. If you use antibiotics in, in this situation, one, you're possibly promoting resistance, but in addition to that, the patients will not improve to any significant degree. And this uh, uh, CT scan here shows a patient with an acute viral upper respiratory infection. And two weeks later, without any treatments, you can sort of see the response that the patient uh, has had uh, just uh, with uh, supportive care. So what is implicated in acute bacterial rhinosinusitis? And as you can see in this chart, really the three main uh, causes uh, that you should remember are strep pneumonia, H flu, and Moraxella uh, catarralis. Those are the three most common uh, bacteria that causes uh, rhinosinusitis. There are other things uh, such as staph aureus and anaerobes that can also do the same. However, uh, the uh, just uh, note the, the three main causes. So let's talk a little bit about the treatment algorithm of an acute uh, rhinosinusitis attack. And so initially, symptomatic therapy, hydration, and observation is appropriate. If the signs and symptoms begin to wane after about five to seven days, then great, the patient probably has just a viral uh, URI and nothing has to be uh, done other than supportive care. Now. On the other hand, if the signs or symptoms worsen after five days or last greater than 10 days, then the patient probably has an acute sinus infection. And for those patients uh, with community-acquired infection, if the patient is health otherwise healthy, high dose amoxicillin for seven to 14 days, typically I do 10 days, uh, should be uh, instituted. For those that fail to improve at all within approximately two days, we may consider switching the antibiotic to a broad spectrum antibiotic or possibly even a, a beta lactamase uh, resistant antibiotic for another 10 days. Now, for those patients who uh, are immune compromised or have been uh, recently hospitalized or have chronic conditions, then in that situation, we would actually jump to the broad spectrum or the beta lactamase resistant uh, antibiotics, such as uh, augmented 
And so these are the most common antibiotics that we use for uh, rhinosinusitis. And just make note of uh, the, the first four. The respiratory quinolones are thought to be effective in 95% of all sinusitis, and that includes Cipro, Leviquin, Avalox, high-dose uh, amoxicillin uh, or uh, high-dose augmentin is also thought to be very uh, highly effective in 94% of, of the cases. Ceftriaxone is also highly effective along with uh, amoxicillin. As you can see, uh, there are a slew of other uh, antibiotics that can be utilized uh, you know, with uh, sinusitis uh, as well. Now, let's talk a little bit about, uh, now we've already talked about viral, we've already talked about bacterial. Let's talk a little bit about allergic fungal sinusitis. And this isn't a, an invasive process. Uh, many people here, here, here in Houston, especially in, in, in a damp climate, will come down with allergic fungal sinusitis. And this is the typical CT scan of a patient with allergic fungal sinusitis. Sinus disease and maxillary sinus. Ethmoid sinus is here, as you can see. It's actually eroding some of the bones of the orbit. It's eroding some of the bones of the skull base. You can just sort of see the entire pathology here, eroding the bones of the sphenoid sinus. Looks like it's going into the pterygoid spaces. And also possible some extension intracranially as well. But keep in mind, this is an allergic process and it's not an invasive process. So the treatment really resides in steroids, antibiotics, antifungals, uh, as well as uh, surgical clearance of the disease. The reason why antibiotics are frequently used is because frequently the polyps block off the sinuses and many patients have an active sinus infection, a bacterial sinus infection, along with a fungal sinusitis. So this is sort of what we saw inside the patient. So this is an actual video of that same patient's surgery. And as you can see, you can see polyps inside the nose here. We're using a device called an oscillating debrider, which sort of sucks and cuts at the same time. So we're removing the polyps, we're opening up the sinuses, we're removing all the uh, fungal mucin out of the nose. We're looking into the sphenoid sinus now. We're palpating the carotid artery there carotid artery on the opposite side. We're removing the sinus disease right there from the ter pterygoid uh, space. Now, the allergic fungal is completely different from the invasive fungal sinusitis. Invasive fungal sinusitis typically occurs in those who are uh, severely immune compromised or in diabetics uh, who have poorly controlled uh, sugars. And uh, we, we see patients uh, also uh, who are uh, on uh, a lot of immunosuppressive uh, medications, such as transplant patients as well. Typically, it's a uh, fungal uh, uh, sinusitis with invasion of the fungus into the blood vessels, causing necrosis of the tissues, which then promotes uh, more fungus uh, growth. And so when we look inside at these patients' uh, nostrils, as you can see, you see a lot of necrotic tissue. Normal side is shown on the other side. And as you can see on the CT scan, it really doesn't look that much different from just a regular sinus infection. So you need to have a high suspicion, uh, clinical suspicion, whenever you're consulted on a patient who may be immunocompromised with uh, a possible sinus uh, complaint. So what are some of the surgical treatments for sinusitis? And so like we sort of talked about earlier, just opening up the sinuses, removing the blockage of the sinuses. And so they, and this is a, a view of a polyp inside the patient's nose. And as you can see, the polyp is just blocking all the drainage pathways of the sinuses. And so we're sort of opening up the, the drainage pathways here. We're removing the pus from inside the maxillary sinus in this situation clearing the uh, inflamed tissue, removing the polyps, opening up the sinuses, removing the pus from the sinuses, and we typically will irrigate the sinuses with uh, an antibiotic. And uh, uh, we, we also will place uh, certain packing, uh, dissolvable packing typically, 
to prevent any scar tissue from forming as well. Now we also do uh, a much more minimally invasive uh, techniques as well. Some patients will complain of weather change related headaches and in that situation the CT scan may look completely normal. However, uh, the, uh, the openings of the sinuses may be so small that it is not able to uh, maintain the same atmospheric pressure from the environment to the inside of the sinuses. And in that situation all we do is we'll actually place a small little balloon directly into the opening of the sinuses and this is the sphenoid sinus which has been dilated with this balloon. And all we do is we dilate the openings of the sinus, pull the balloons out and that's it. No cutting involved, just dilation. Same uh, technology as uh, cardiac catheterization and uh, this technique also works very well in a select set of uh, the patients that we see. Now briefly, in the last part of our talk, let's talk a little bit about the complications of sinusitis. And so as you can imagine, because of where the sinuses lie, the complications are typically associated with the structures that lie close to the sinuses that are infected. And so frequently what you can see is infection of the ethmoid sinuses, which can then cause an orbital cellulitis, as seen in this patient. You can also actually get infection from the frontal sinuses that go posteriorly, and you can also get a brain abscess as well. In addition to that, you can see in this coronal cut, I'm sorry, you can also see in this axial cut, uh, evidence of frontal sinus disease here, as well as here, but you can also see that the frontal anterior table is actually eroded from this uh, patient's sinus disease, and is actually causing swelling of the patient's forehead here. So this, so this is when actually the anterior table is eroded and this uh, axial scan shows when the posterior table is eroded causing a uh, brain abscess. And lastly, if you have sinus infections, typically patients are blowing their nose quite a bit. In some instances, uh, especially if the patient has had previous surgeries inside the nose and or trauma, uh, you can also blow air directly into the orbit as well. And so that is also one thing that you need to uh, be aware of if a patient uh, complains of swelling of the face after blowing the nose and uh, you feel some crepitance uh, uh, beneath the skin in that area, there is a possibility that the patient is blowing air from the nose up into the sinuses, uh, out, through, out of the sinuses uh, into uh, the, uh, the orbit. And that is uh, all uh, when it uh, comes to sinusitis. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email me at uh, takashim at bcm.edu, and I'll be happy to talk to you further about this interesting topic. Thank you.